uh, state question 777, the right to farm. We're also going to be uh, discussing state question 779, which is the, uh, the one cent tax, uh, tax for education. And so we have two special speakers here tonight, and thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Gage, if you'll come first. Uh, Gage Milliman is with the Oklahoma Farm Bureau. He serves as the liaison between the County Farm Bureaus and the State Farm Bureau. He also works to ensure counties are informed about issues affecting agriculture and rural Oklahoma. He's a native of Newton, Illinois, and received a bachelor's degree in animal science from Southern Illinois University. Before joining the Oklahoma Farm Bureau, he worked as an Oklahoma State University Extension Agent for nine years and he grew up on a corn, soybean, wheat, and hay farm in South Central Illinois, so he definitely knows farming. He also raises Charlotte cattle with his wife, Krista, and his son, Henry. He enjoys, uh, he enjoys raising cattle, riding horses, baseball, and the St. Louis Cardinal. Any booze in the audience? Just kidding. You slide, is that what you said? No, I'm just a big fan. Oh, big fan. All right, we're going to let, I think Gage is going to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll allow some questions. Now, tonight is our pro these state questions. The people that are speaking tonight are wanting to get us to vote for these state questions next week, next month. At our meeting, uh, I think it's October 13th, 11th, uh, we are going to have the against side, the people that are going to come in and speak to us and trying to convince us to vote against these state questions. So that's what it's going to be about tonight. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, so who in the room has heard about state question 777? Have you heard anything good about it? <laughs> All right. Uh, it's it's interesting. We've been after this, or I have been part of it for over a year now. Uh, started in July in 2015, and uh, we spent the first six or eight months just trying to inform people. And uh, it's, it's actually kind of encouraging to get into a room and most people at least have heard about it. And hopefully this close to the election that we have. Um, so if you have this handout here. This is the uh, the amendment, how it will appear on the ballot. And I apologize if I didn't bring enough. And I actually have some more of these in the truck. Good, good for you guys. This is one of the bigger crowds I've spoke to in a group like this. Uh, so I can get more of these if, if you didn't get one at the end of the, of the day. So what this does, it'll add measure. Uh, this measure adds Section 38 to Article 2 of the Oklahoma Constitution. And it creates constitutional rights. It creates the following guaranteed rights to engage in farming and ranching the right to make use of agriculture technology, the right to make use of livestock procedures, and the right to make use of ranching practices. So and then it kind of explains here, so that's what the amendment's gonna be uh, with the including down here, the measure and the protections that if out above do not apply to and do not impact state laws related to trespass, eminent domain, dom uh, dominance of mineral interest, easements, right of way, or other property rights, and any state statutes and political sub division ordinances enacted before December 31st, 2014 and before will stay in intact. So why did we why do we need this and where did this came come from? Well, this has been in the process for over four years. Uh, we came up uh, mostly Farm Bureau, uh, <coughs> submitted this and, and asked for this, uh, but we've had other agriculture organizations across the state that were involved in this also. So we got the bill wrote and it took us three sessions to pass this. So this isn't new. Uh, and this is why we're so passionate about it as an organization because we've been working on it a long time. So uh, it didn't pass uh, the first three times or the first two times for different reasons. Uh, one of them is the uh, compelling state interest that it mentions in the paragraph I skipped over for whatever reason. I didn't plan to read the whole thing to you so I apologize for reading what I did. So basically in the future, if a law is going to be passed that will affect how we operate in agriculture, it will have to meet a compelling state interest. Uh, when this passed in Missouri back in 2014, and it's already passed in North Dakota in 2012, uh, the one in Missouri, this, it reads similar to this, uh, but it just says, will not infringe on our rights, period. 
and that was something that the legislation wanted. Well, we need to have a way to explain how we do pass laws in the future, and uh, the compelling state interest was added, one of the last things that was added, and this came through session two sessions ago. Uh, so it's been, I remember being a legislative breakfast in Bartlesville in April of 2015, and this was already assigned, we knew it would be on the ballot uh, November 8, 2016. And at that time we had concerns that it would be during a presidential election and that may, this may get overshadowed and, and at that time we had no idea the uh, circus that the election was going to turn into. Uh, so not our choice, that's just where it fell, uh, but this did come through session two sessions ago. Passed through the House and the Senate with 90% uh, of the uh, legislators supporting it, so bipartisan, overwhelming support. and. Uh, the reason we ask for this is because we've seen it in other states as well as here in Oklahoma is we have extremist groups that don't like what we do and especially the animal rights groups and the biggest one is Humane Society of the United States. Uh, you might have heard of a group called P PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Uh, PETA is not very effective. Uh, they're actually radical enough that not too many people take them seriously but the Humane Society of the United States is, is very well funded, they're very well organized and they are very effective in what they do. They have not had a lot of success on the national level, but they have on a state level. Uh, some examples, in uh, California, they did, passed a proposition back in 2008 that said that the laying hen cages, the, the cages laying hens were in were too small. They needed to be 30% bigger. There was no science, no fact, nobody in the ag industry came up with this number. I, I don't know where they came up with the 30% bigger, um, but if you, if you asked anybody that was regulating that, they said those animals are tr being treated humane, they are uh, not being abused, they're happy where they are, but anyway, went to the vote of the people, it passed. So in that time, you had, once it went into effect, uh, you had a couple options. You could just go out of business, uh, which some small producers did, or you could completely take out all of your cages and go in and put those in that are 30% bigger, which a lot of big corporations did because they could afford to do that. Or what a lot of them did is they just went in and knocked out a center panel uh, of the existing cages they had, which doubled the size of the cage, which reduced the number of birds they had in half, which of course uh, reduced their uh, production in half. So at that time, the price of eggs uh, went up to over $6 a dozen. And as the opposition has pointed out, if you call California and Kroger or whatever in Los Angeles, eggs are not $6 a dozen. Uh, but what they did is they started shipping in eggs from surrounding states. And their legislation is in the process, and I haven't heard where they are on it, of trying to pass a law that will, any eggs that comes into the state of California will have to be raised under California's, or produced under California standards. So if that does pass, then we will see that increase of eggs, uh, price of eggs go up and up. So we have a lot of poultry on the east side of the state, and there's been some issues. Uh, opposition talks about this is going to end uh, regulation of agriculture. They can do whatever they want. Big corporations can, can pollute the water, they can pollute the land, pollute the air, uh, all those things. Well, as it says here in black and white, any ordinance enacted before December 31st, 2014 and before, will stay in place. If it was illegal to drop poultry litter, uh, waste in the water before then, which it was, it will continue to be illegal. So uh, that's something that water is just really not an issue. It's something that they drive. Uh, there's billboards. I, I drive it by every time I come down here it's in Tulsa. It says no one industry should control our water. I agree. Water is important to all of us. Uh, and and they'll, they'll claim, the opposition claims that you just cannot produce uh, and, and uh, make a compelling state interest, nothing will fall under that. And I, I'll agree, if you can't get water to fall under a compelling state interest, I agree, nothing will. But I would hope and I would think that a judge would rule if uh, it's affecting water uh, use of people downstream, that person, if they're not already breaking the law, which they probably are, uh, they will be held responsible and uh, they will have to clean that up. So, things we have here in, in Oak Bogey County, I've been down here and judged your uh, cattle show uh, two years in a row, so I was down here in the fall and the spring. Uh, you have a great group uh, out here at your extension office, know Doug Maxey really well, work with him quite often. Um, so, we are in cattle country, so we think about, and we're not even in feedlot country, where a lot of the Humane Society people think that feedlot cattle are, shouldn't be on dirt, and they need to be out on grass and all that. So what does Eastern Oklahoma care about and Cattlemen's Association care about this. 
Well, there are things that uh, HSUS thinks we ought not do. And a couple of those things are castration and dehorning. And we have been through a lot of processes with them, and we've convinced them that this is safety for the animals, uh, the quality of the product at the end is so much better. Uh, can, you know, they don't like a feedlot full of steers. I don't like a feedlot full of bulls. Uh, they don't get along real well. It, it's not, you know, it's a hazard for the workers. It's a hazard for the, those animals. So they've agreed, okay, yeah, I understand. <laughs> Uh, it's safety of the animals, safety of people working on them. So we need to castrate and dehorn. But if we're going to do it, we need to do it. We need to sedate those animals, animals before we do it. So in the state, well, not just state of Oklahoma, but it is against the law for me as a cattle producer to sedate an animal. Uh, I don't have horses, cattle. I grew up showing pigs, all those things. Uh, so if, if a law like that were to pass, only a veterinarian could castrate and dehorn cattle. And uh, in that case. Uh, Good luck finding that veterinarian because we're already short on uh, large animal veterinarians as it is and not to mention i can save myself a lot of money uh, doing those practices myself and once again uh, they say this benefits corporate farming if you have to have a vet come out and do all your work who's going to be able to afford that the guy that has 200,000 cows not the guy like me that has 20 cows uh, so those are the type of things that we want to be able to uh, head off in the future and have some extra support uh, when something like that happens. So does this mean that a law can never be passed again? No, not everything's gonna be challenged. What is it, if the law is passed, one of those I mentioned, say we uh, outlaw, um, well, another one is antibiotic use. And there's a lot of discussion on, discussion on that. And uh, I've, I've treated, I've got 10 calves that are on uh, pasture right now, just growing a little bit. Cattle prices aren't any good, so I'm just gonna wait until they go lower, I guess. I don't know what my plan is. Uh, but I've treated three of those 10 with antibiotics since I weaned them uh, back in June, the end of June. And uh, I want to continue to have that ability to do that. And uh, of those three, I'm certain one of them would have died had he not been given that antibiotic. Uh, but we will follow the, uh, the withdrawal periods that are set by the FDA, which once again is federal. Uh, all the meats inspections when we, uh, when we process those cattle is done by the USDA, which is federal. So this has nothing to do on anything that comes from a federal level, only on a state level. Uh, some of the people on our side, uh, they ask about the EPA. Will this kick EPA out of the state of Oklahoma? No, sorry, it won't. And they're like, well, I don't even know if I'm gonna waste my time with it then, because I want the EPA gone. And uh, well, there's a lot of things that we have to, but we'll still have to answer the EPA, of course. Um, so we can still pass laws. In North Dakota and in uh, Missouri, like I said, this has already passed. Not once has this changed anything there at this time. And uh, that's what we say, this isn't for today. We have good support from our legislators at the, at the Capitol right now, uh, but this is for tomorrow. This is for, I've got a two-year-old son, this is for when he's my age. Because uh, every, every year we get more people, population in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. A lot of people say this is taking away our voice, our legislators, uh, opportunity to uh, to pass laws for us. Well, us, those of us in rural Oklahoma are losing our voice more and more all the time. Right now, if you include uh, Tulsa and Oklahoma City, it's 34% of Oklahoma's population. If you include the surrounding areas of Edmond and Midwest City and Bixby, Sand Springs, Owasso, Broken Arrow, it's already 50%. Uh, so the longer we go and the further people get removed from agriculture and they don't understand how these processes work, this is when this is going to come in to, uh, into play. So a lady in Jefferson City, Missouri did use, try to use this. She got caught growing marijuana in her basement. And uh, this was one that came on earlier. The opposition even dropped this one. They say it's not going to allow you to grow marijuana. So uh, she, But she challenged based on her right to farm. She had a right to farm. It's a crop. I should be able to raise what I want. Uh, that was not withheld. She was still charged with a crime. Uh, but, but nothing. So if you hear the opposition shit say that uh, corporate ag, which I'm not sure what that is, nobody's defined me what big ag or corporations are, 98% uh, of all farms and ranches in Oklahoma are, are family owned. Uh, and some of those in that 2% are like hitch feed yards, who it's the hitch family that runs that, but it's big enough that they've had to incorporate it, and it is a corporation. So uh, not a single piece of legislation uh, has been passed that somebody has challenged and the right to farm in Missouri or North Dakota has has withheld upheld that ruling it's not it's not happened and like I say in Oklahoma we don't expect it to happen we don't expect it in five years I don't expect it to happen 10 years maybe 15 years good chance 20 years yes 
we are going to have issues that come through. Uh, we are dealing with things all the time. Has anybody here seen a, a product in the store called, uh, when you're looking at your chicken selections and you see it says uh, raised without hormones? Anybody seen that on chicken? There is no hormone labeled for legal use in chicken and pork. So if you see it labeled on chicken and pork, it's just a marketing scheme. Uh, trying to make you think that this piece is better than that one because it was raised without hormones. Other than the natural hormones that already occur in there. Does not happen. Beef cattle, we do uh, have hormones that we can implant in their ear. Over time it dissolves and it increases their feed efficiency. Uh, in most cases it's estrogen. And uh, I, I, I struggle to say this in front of some groups, but to relate, uh, whenever, uh, the, you all know that women often gain weight easier and men can, can lose it faster. Uh, a lot of that estrogen plays a role, have the same way in cattle. However, even then, an implanted steer calf, uh, the estrogen levels in his meat will still be, in most cases, will be lower than a heifer with the, the estrogen in her carcass uh, just from natural estrogen occurring. So it's things like that that we have to take the time to educate and remind that we do not use uh, hormones in chicken and we do not use hormones in beef. Uh, same way with uh, grass-fed fed cattle, all natural. They don't, you know, we want those options to still be on the table. We don't want to take those things away. But uh, there's getting to be a real divide between the small gardeners, the, the small farmers with their organic products, their all natural products, and uh, I'm all for that. Those are great. Uh, but I'm not for them using those tactics like to say that organic product is better, it's more nutritious, there's no science that backs that. Um, so in the future, with this law in place, uh, not everything's going to be challenged, keep that in mind. I, I did talk to a lawyer about this once because we've asked some questions and he says almost every bill that's passed is challenged. You know, it may not go anywhere, but somebody will raise their hand and say, I don't like that, that's unconstitutional, we shouldn't do that. Uh, but what this does is, uh, at one, if it's challenged, uh, we think it's infringing on our rights to, to do our normal farming and ranching practices. We can basically sue on, uh, based on that, and it will go in front of a judge, and that judge will take in uh, his research from people that are experts in the field and ask them, does this need to be passed or does it not need to be passed in the best interest of farmers, ranchers, and the citizens of Oklahoma? And, and he will make that decision. And a lot of people, like I say, on our side, they're like, you want to put this in the hands of a judge? Well, it's better than putting it in the hands of Wayne Caselli or Christian Cassie, who sits on the uh, Kirkpatrick Foundation here in Oklahoma and uh, also sits on the National Board for Humane Society of the United States. So we have them right here in the state that are trying to pass these things, and their ultimate goal is to end ag animal agriculture. They want us to all be vegetarians. And that's all it amounts to. And they have a lot of money. Where do they get their money? I always like to tell this story. When the tornado came through more, was that 2013? Whenever it came through more, uh, did all that damage. Oklahoma, HSUS came into Oklahoma and they raised $1.7 million in Oklahoma from Oklahomans. <clears throat> and in the name of we're going to provide shelter, vet care, food and water for these animals until they can be reunited with their owners. <coughs> Do you know how much money they spent in Oklahoma? $110,000. And that's pretty standard for what they do. They spend less than 1% of their money they raise actually helping uh, animals and, and helping shelters. And, and I always make sure I plug this too. If, if you are one of those that's sending your 1995 a month to HSUS, please stop sending that money because all you're doing is paying people to come argue things like this. And then, uh, but go give that money $20 a month to your local Humane Society because they are in no way connected with Humane Society of the United States. And it, in the same way, HSUS does not give them any money. Um, I don't know who you have coming to speak. Uh, there are two groups that uh, oppose us. Uh, one is the uh, Stewardship Council that's been formed in Tulsa. And keep in mind, these groups have been formed just to oppose this. As I tell people, I work for Farm Bureau before. I've worked for Farm Bureau for a year. Before that, I've been a Farm Bureau member for eight years. I was a board member of Noata County for four years. Uh, so I believe in what Farm Bureau does. And uh, once November 8th is over, I will still work for Farm Bureau. Uh, the guys that work for Stewardship Council, uh, that won't be anymore. They are being funded by Humane Society of the United States, and then also Christian Cassidy and Kirkpatrick Foundation themselves have put in some money. Well, then there's the other side. There's another group, the Oklahoma's for Food, Farm, and Family, which is created name, and uh, but it was just formed to oppose this. You get on their Facebook page, it says that uh, we uh, our main 
uh, goal is to oppose 777. That's their only goal. And they hired an attorney called Bud Scott, who uh, has done some great things with farmers markets, things like that. Uh, I think he's an attorney for the uh, Oklahoma City Farmers Market. Uh, he's done a great job with a lot of those things, uh, but he is an attorney, and they have hired him to run their campaign, campaign and be their speaker. And he makes a point to let you know that he is not funded by the United States of the United States. And that is true. They're keeping their money separate. Uh, why they don't join that together and help each other out, I don't know. Uh, but that's what they are doing. Um, I, I can't set, speak it for them anymore. You'll just have to listen to what they have to say next month. And, and they can uh, they can fill you in on what their goals are and, and what they are setting out to do. I think I pretty much covered uh, our goals and, and where we started with this process and what we're hoping to accomplish with it. I don't know if I'm even close to my 20 minutes, but... I've always found in most crowds, if you get down a little early, nobody complains too much. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Questions? Yeah. We all sounds okay, but then we get down to uh, no law can interfere with these rights unless the law is justified by a compelling state interest, a clearly identified state interest of the highest order. Now, what in the world does that mean? That's it. So basically, what it entails is, uh, and, and the lawyer will give you a different answer, but it's what's in the best interest for the safety, the welfare, and the safety and the welfare and the bet and the, the, be the well-being of the citizens of Oklahoma. Well, doesn't that put it right back on the legislature? to, to uh, intervene? It'll be put on a judge. A judge will have to make that decision. The judge is bound by the law. Right. And if they pass another one, the judge is going to be bound by it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're hoping, that he was withholds the law what the law is supposed to be and makes that decision based on the facts that are presented, not just on feel-good initiatives. Uh, so... You have a question? Yes, sir. yes, sir. I got a question. You know, in the state of Oklahoma, there's a tendency to put every controversial item that the state legislature can't agree on as a, as a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the United States Constitution has been amended just a handful of times. The Oklahoma Constitution has been amended probably more times than any other constitution in the, in the Union. Mm -hmm. You know, the average person does not understand all these state questions. And for, it's like there's a, there's a, uh, cyclical thing that I see happening is every time they can't agree, it goes to the state or it goes to the voters. And I've, I worked for the uh, uh, election board for 12 straight years, and if you see some of the voters that come in to vote, they do not know. I agree. And the other thing I always say is, you know, the uh, Nebraska Farm Bureau came out against a constitutional amendment in the state of Nebraska, probably one of the biggest agricultural producing states in the union, because they didn't want to make it a constitutional amendment. They wanted laws that the legislation passed which said, let's protect the rights of farmers and ranchers today through a law, not through a constitutional amendment. So, to, I don't know if there's a question in there, but to address that, so to, to amend the Constitution has to go to the voters. Sure. So, and that's what we asked for, because they'll bring that up, the opposition says we already have the right to farm. Well, we have a statute that uh, protects us against nuisance complaints. But it's a statute, and the thing with a law and a statute is it can re be repelled by the legislature but next repelled, session. Then, then, go to the, then go to the voters for a right to farm act. I mean, if it's repealed, I mean, wh why wouldn't you wait to see if it becomes a problem? You yeah. know, because if it's a problem, it's too late. Because but how do you know it's going to be a problem? You're predicting that it's going to be right. a problem. And if it never becomes a problem, you'll never hear but this, of this again. But this language is so vague. I mean, a judge can interpret this, however. You're going to bound every state legislature in the future. You don't we have no idea what the future is going to hold. We're going to bound. Uh, well, what we've seen in other states, in Florida, uh, California, Arizona, on what they've done outlawing uh, or different things they've done on crates, whether it be pork or, or poultry, uh, we can see that coming. And it's probably Oklahoma are probably one of the last states it gets to. And that's what comes up a lot of times too. Is like we have great support at the Capitol. Why do we need this? I, that's exactly 100% true, and that's why I say I bet it's going to be 20 years before we even have this come up. But if we wait until we were losing, we wait until we're losing the battle, this would never pass in California because the people are already passing things that are taking it the opposite direction. So now is the time. And if Oklahoma can't pass this, nobody can. And uh, 
it, it, like I say, if we wait, if we wait, it'll be too late. Now is the time to do it well, while we have the support. Yeah, I got a couple, three questions for you. One, you grew up in a farming family. Yeah. <clears throat> Define that farming family. How big an operation was it? When I was a kid, my uh, my dad and my uncle farmed together. We farmed about a little over a thousand acres. By the time I was in high school, my uncle, I have two cousins, boys. My uncle has two boys, my dad has two boys. It was pretty obvious the farm wasn't going to hold us all. It split, and my dad farmed about 400, so my uncle had 600. They've actually added to it with uh, uh, lease land, things like that. And right now, today, my dad farms uh, about 300 acres. And uh, my brother's working in Kansas. And Is I'm that the main source of income? No. No. My dad's a self-employed carpenter. So, when the, as I say, when the sun's shining, my dad's working. Okay. Either farming or okay. roofing houses. Because, see, a lot of times we get this impression we hear this deal about the farm. Yeah. And everybody thinks, has a mindset, and not and mainly because I'm old, but the day my granddad farmed like 160 acres and they had truck farm and they had cattle and then when they went through the depression, people would come work for them for potatoes. Mm -hmm. And then they had a peanut you know, crop. And then that went through the <laughs> government control of getting allotments and this, that, and the other. Back in the 70s, we had this farm aid deal. You'd go out in western Oklahoma, you'd hear about the poor farmer. I mean, you hear, and it, it really is a heart-wrenching deal. And, and you don't want to see that lifestyle leave. But then you get out there and here's what you find out. What happened was these wheat farmers, they have good years, and then they leverage against two or three more sections because somebody like your dad and your uncle split the deal up, they'll buy a section, they'll buy another section, and then they have a couple of bad years. And then the next thing you know, well then, it's the poor farmer. It's this, it's that, and everything. And it's big business. I mean, these deals are multi, multi-million dollar deals. Now you get out in western Oklahoma now, and you've got Cargill out there, which probably owns, between Hitch and Cargill, they own western Oklahoma. And they were believing that's not That's not true. But, <coughs> but, but well, I'll, I'll explain that too. But anyway, but let me tell you what. They farm that land, they're sucking the water out of that aquifer out there. Luckily, we've had a good year. And, but like, and I know all about Cargill. I'm a retired federal agent. I worked a case on them back east. I can tell you stories about Cargill that will not enamor you to big business, whether it's agriculture or the farmer or whatever. But nevertheless, they go out there and now they grow their own feed, they got their hog deals, this, that, and the other. It's all big business. This old deal about the guy with 80 acres out here, and if you've got 20 head of cattle, let me tell you, and I've worked on a 750 cow-calf operation out in Roswell, New Mexico, and that's a ranch. 20 head or one, I've got 35 or what, that ain't a ranch, that's hobby farming. You know, you might as well take your money, go to Vegas, put it down on a roulette wheel and spin it around and exactly. at least you won't waste three years losing 10 or $15,000 and that's reality. Yep. We're talking about reality now, we're not talking about theory. The next thing about Farm Bureau is, you had this big deal up in Missouri, you're, I mean, you gotta be aware of this case where this big hog operation came in and the guy was a Farm Bureau member, and he was a little guy mm -hmm. down the road. Farm Bureau kicked him to the curb, and they went to bat for this guy, and they put in a 5,000 head <laughs> hog operation. And it's in lawsuits and this, that, and that, killed his property value, did his whole deal. What's your take on that? How do you, I mean, how do you, how do you do that? Deal? Well, my take on that is this question then wouldn't have anything to do with that. So you mentioned big ag. Uh, agriculture is the second uh, leading piece of the economy in Oklahoma buying oil and gas. Right. It is big business. I'm not I'm not saying it's not. But you talk about being in lawsuits with Cargill, things like that, or being in, in things with them. Well, who's going to have the ability to fight those lawsuits? It's going to be the big guy. And yeah, I have 20 cows, and I'm, I work for Farm Bureau because I can't afford. They basically have 115 acres, and they barely make my land payment. But if, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have the land. But uh, I'm not making any money with my 20 cows. Of course. But, uh, but I want to be able to, can, I also, we raise Charlet bulls, and I sell Charlet bulls to big producers, have 100, 200 cows, I call those big producers, where I'm at, you have 200 cows, you're pretty big. And uh, so those bulls, over time, we produce a lot of calves with our little herd. And I think there's a value in what I do. And, uh, and we can also spend more time working on genetics, uh, spend more, more uh, you know, if I'm only have 20 cows, they better but be the big best. Big already, already got the, 
Yeah. Got the deal. You can go to RFD TV and one night I said, I listened for an hour or two hours and was six of the greatest experts on genetics in the cattle business. And when they started off and I listened and I got down at the end and at the end of two hours, what these guys had finally said about genetics, they had gotten so good at genetics that now the cow was bigger, the calves were bigger, what they all were producing for, more, more, more. Yep. And the problem was the cow was eating more, yep. the calf was eating more. Exactly. So uh, 50 or 60 years of taking the computer and doing genetics, yep. Mother Nature had kicked them in the head. Yep. And that was the end of the deal. I mean, these were the greatest experts in the world. Yep. So when you start talking genetics, that's big business. Yep. You know, these big ranches, these are multi, multi-million dollar deals. And of course, we all know that we don't want, uh, you know, the situation where you, you got Turner coming in. And when I was out in New Mexico, that was a problem with him buying the ranches up and turn them into buffalo runs. So. Yep. Well, I mean, it's a good example that uh, they're going to do that whether we pass this or not. Um, but I, you mentioned Cargill. My uncle, my uncle does farm full time now. Him and my uh, two cousins, and they have a hog operation. Well, back in the late '90s, when hogs dropped to eight dollars a hundred, uh, they if anybody, most independent hog producers went out of business, or or they joined a corporation. So my uncle built a hog facility for Cargill, 500 sows, which is a small unit. Right. That's not a lot. 500 sows. Within seven years, he had his buildings paid off. My uncle owns the land. He owns the barn. He owns, he's in charge of everything. So if there's anything questions with the EPA or his waste management, that's all on him. Right. He, Cargill owns the pigs, they own the feed, they own the medication it takes to take care of them, the ear tags, whatever else. Uh, but after that, he signs a contract every so often. And I think the first one was seven years because that's how long it took him to pay off his barns. And then after that, uh, he's actually been with two different companies since then. And now he is, he and my cousins are taking out all the crates and uh, just doing a feeding operation. But had it not been for Cargill, he would not be in the pig business today. I guarantee you. And, uh, you know, right or wrong, there's a lot of things out there that aren't great. Uh, but this isn't going, this isn't going to give the big ag more protection. It's not going to give them less. It, it, it is what it is. Uh, we have, Cindy, did you have one quick question? Yes. And then we need to move on to the next thing. There are some cities that's already come out in opposition yeah. to this. What is the reasoning? Why they're just already coming out in opposition and the biggest reason, res, you know, city yeah. The biggest reason is because Bud Scott, who's the, been hired to run the Oklahoma Farm Food and Family, is a former uh, chairman for the Oklahoma Municipal League. So he knows these people personally by hand, by and and that, that's fine. And that's what we're using actually uh, with our Farm Bureau members, our Cattlemen's members. Uh, we're putting big signs out. You've probably seen some of them. Uh, we have a lot of people on the ground. Not too many campaigns have the amount of manpower that we have. Uh, so you use those connections that you have. So he has those connections. Those are people he's worked with. Uh, their concerns are, um, you know, I guess they have concerns that it's going to allow uh, somebody to put in a, a poultry farm or a pig farm right in the city limits. And that's not true because any ordinance that's in place 2014 and before will stay that way. So there's no... There's no truth to that at all. And then, so then they say that, well, we can pollute the water upstream and then all of a sudden, or uh, all of a sudden, the, the municipality does not have water anymore. You know, I only have 20 cows, but I haul, those 10 calves I have, I haul water to them every day, 300 gallons. I take it out of the tap. We're on a rural water district that buys from the city of no water. If somebody pollutes the city of no water's water, my family's out of luck, my cattle are out of luck. Uh, so that's very important to us. Uh, they have also come up with things like, uh, if we, if if a farmer is irrigating his land because of this, the irrigation water will take precedence precedence over municipality water. Mike, you know, if if people need water in town to to drink and bathe in and take care of their families, uh, we're just going to let that crop die that year. I guarantee you that. So that's what they've been told. That's why they're opposing it. Uh, but none of that is relevant. And one of the problems we have in Oklahoma County. And it's never been addressed in a completely democratic controlled county. So we've never ever had zoning ordinances. We're 395 years behind civilization. There are no zoning ordinances. So let me tell you what, if you don't live in a municipality that has a zoning ordinance, which 
God, I, who, else, who knows whether old Longy or Henrietta have the zoning ordinance or what if it's kept up. But they can move one of these giant hog operations in right down the road from you on, you know, your same road or whatever and be adjacent to you. And so, but we don't have any zoning ordinances in this state. And that's, a, and that's, that's probably my biggest complaint about being for 777. If we were up to date in our zoning ordinance, you had zoning ordinance to protect the people, blah, 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 then that'd be a different thing. So that's, it's kind I'll of- agree, I agree with that. If your city doesn't, I, I was surprised this city of Tulsa allows you to, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something but like- But the county have, doesn't. The county zoning is what the one doesn't have. Oh, they don't have a hint of it. And like I said, all they have to do is point a commission and get it done. It can be done relatively fast, but let me tell you what, they're filling up potholes out here. Yeah. Put a tent on it. So. I agree. If it's not in place, uh, this could help out whoever's trying to build something in the future. That's right. Gage, thank you so All much. Right, thank you. Stick around. I will. Okay.